think it's important to mention in this context that two-thirds of our members are women that work in uh, social services, healthcare, municipal and community service, central government and public utilities such as water and uh, electricity. And um, we develop uh, worldwide uh, campaigns uh, for social and economic justice and uh, quality uh, public services. And we work closely with affiliated unions to promote uh, free collective bargaining, uh, workers' rights, and to fight for uh, gender equality and dignity uh, for all. We support affiliated unions through capacity building on the one hand, and then the other through um, uh, international solidarity uh, actions. And this is especially important for those countries where workers are fighting for uh, uh, trade union rights, but of course also for workers' rights. Uh, which unfortunately are uh, still very numerous. I mean, we're active at the moment. We're running trade union rights campaigns uh, in more than uh, 50 countries. Um, as Ogmundura uh, mentioned, uh, PSI uh, has been uh, somewhat of a pioneer in terms of uh, developing gender equality policies uh, in public services, but also in the uh, trade union movement. And in the, um, uh, every five years, PSI organizes its World Congress. And in the last uh, Congress in November 2012, uh, gender equality was again established as one of the main areas of, uh, of action for, uh, for PSI. And that, um, uh, this action plan is based on a, on a, on a concern um, that uh, women continue to face uh, various forms, uh, multiple forms of discrimination, and that um, austerity uh, policies um, deepen historic uh, disadvantages and inclusion, and basically are moving, uh, you know, backwards um, from very hard-won um, uh, women empowerment and the feminist movement of the, you know, in the post-war uh, period. Um, the, there is a general analysis that in, in spite of the increasing participation of women in all sectors of economic ac activity, discrimination uh, remi remains widespread and that even in the public sector, which is the largest employer of women in the formal economy worldwide, women are concentrated in lower paid positions. Um, another important concern is the uh, um, the um, existence of widespread gender-based violence, uh, not just domestic violence, but also violence at work, um, and uh, violence against uh, uh, trade union leaders, women trade union leaders, which unfortunately is also very much a reality uh, around, around the world. And uh, um, it, it's uh, especially, for example, in, in South America, femicide against trade union leaders, women, is a, is a, is a serious problem today. Um, much of our, um, much of the current uh, gender debate within PSI is linked to the uh, global financial, economic and social crisis. And of course, we link that to issues such as funding of public services, outsourcing of services to private sector providers, and precarious work. And uh, we see that uh, working conditions in public services, which had become acquired rights uh, in certain countries, and then, of course, I think of Europe, uh, are under uh, attack and are often hit when reforms are implemented. These reforms hit uh, women hardest. Uh, equal pay remains an issue even in, uh, in advanced countries, and I will talk a little bit more about that in the uh, next part of my presentation. At the same time, we also think it's really uh, important to uh, talk about power relations between women and men to work together towards gender equality. I mean, I'm quite happy to see a rather balanced presence. Yes, there are, an, I wouldn't say 50% men here in the room, but still there's an acceptable number of men in the room for, for, a, for a meeting which deals with gender equality. I mean, we have to admit it very often, this is not the case. And um, we recognize now that men need to be more involved to promote uh, gender equality, and especially in trade unions, which you know used to be a very much male-dominated type of organization. I mean, this is, of course, a key factor. Um, 
already, I mean, earlier speakers have been talking about challenges and um, I mean, yes, gender equality has been on the agenda for many years, but at the same time, we have to recognize that still a lot of progress needs to be made. Although uh, it's obvious, I mean, and, and that's across the border in the whole world, there are more women than ever working, uh, they're active on the labor market. There are more women in leadership positions and there are more women members and leaders in trade union in trade union organizations although of course we we are very far from the 50 percent you know the 50 percent or the, the equality um, uh, level the uh, international law and um, eu directives uh, such as on equal pay and parental leave have had a very important impact on uh, national policies and on understanding you know, what gender equality is about. And um, I think we really have to recognize this emancipatory uh, effect on nat national legislation by such uh, policies, but a lot more uh, needs to be done to implement them. And as was mentioned by the uh, uh, lady from the Council of Europe, Ms. Lari, Liri, yes. Yeah. Uh, that it's all about implementation. Uh, so that is a positive side. I mean, on the negative side, um, I mean, we have to, you know, we see more migrant uh, women uh, workers, also irregular uh, women workers, which, you know, um, uh, require particular special assistance, uh, social assistance, medical assistance. There are more single mothers than before in uh, when we're talking about the European Union and more elder, uh, older retired uh, women, um, and this is this is a process uh, taking place in an environment in which public services are being cut, privatized, or universal access is being limited, um, which leads to a situation in which uh, women are, are, have to take up, in in the end, compensate for the services that are either not being provided or that they just simply can't afford. Um, and uh, in this context, um, leading to unpaid care work, um, on the one hand, mainly being a female task was also growing, you know, the level of, the level of unpaid care work is also rising. Um, I'm often re reminded by our Secretary General that when we talk about uh, precarious work and uh, um, and about uh, let's say um, uh, wage the wage gap, that actually I mean in the first place you have to have a job, you know, before you can start talking about wages. So I mean we have to recognize that it's women who are being pushed out of the labor market in the first place, you know, when jobs are being cut. And that a lot of female jobs are often precarious, outsourced, or part-time. And this, these are the jobs that have been created in the last 20 years. When we look at the um, situation in Europe, um, there is a uh, uh, we we see a coordinated austerity uh, policies across much of Europe and increases in youth unemployment and social inclusion and. On the one hand, on the other, a recognition of a growing demand for public services and care services, but these are then seen as an individual or market task, not a collective responsibility. And um, one of the earlier speakers referred to, you know, the solidarity, the need for solidarity, and the, you know, that that, that solidarity is a means to achieve universal respect of human rights. And I think that is indeed um, very much um, an. Uh, you know, a theme that that's very close to to the to the uh, analysis that we are making. Um, instead of progress in terms of uh, strengthening a social dialogue, uh, we see um, an, uh, an, an undermining of social dialogue uh, systems, primarily in the let's say new European uh, countries or Eastern European countries, but also in those countries that have been hit hard by the crisis, where collective bargaining systems are simply uh, moved aside, not, not taken into consideration, especially by the Troika and uh, the European Central Bank. Um, when you look at the um, public sector adjustments that have been taking place in the last few years, there's a very interesting uh, ILO study that was just published um, uh, at the end of last year, and um, that um, tells us that 
a lot of these public sector adjustments have been made either um, without assessing the long uh, or short term impact of these reforms, um, that they were very much focused on cutting public expenditure rather than increasing revenue, privatizing outsourcing services without evidence that these will deliver greater efficiency or pro protect equality or quality. And here, I, I mean, the, one of at the introduction, we were talking about the, the, you know, the Cold War, um, uh, the Cold War and the, the cultural diplomacy and things like that. I mean, what we're seeing now is it's, it is also a war, an ideological war. I mean, there is an ideological war of a neoliberal model that is, um, you know, pushing for cuts and smaller states. I mean, whether or not that will deliver the results that, you know, uh, will contribute to to more equality. I mean, which we know it does not. So we are very much in in a similar situation to to some extent. Only it's much more a widespread phenomenon rather than some states against others, and which makes it even more complicated. To which makes which which is why um, platforms such as this and the involvement of parliamentarians, I think, is is so, so important in order to be able to to raise these issues. Um, Yes, um, the, the study clearly showed, and I think you know, coming back to the theme of our, of our meeting, uh, the negative impact on gender equality and on public sector standards of these public uh, service adjustments. And the, uh, I think that's, um, if we look a little bit more in, in detail, um, you know, what austerity really meant in the public sector in terms of uh, employment, uh, cuts for uh, many women, I mean, those range between 10 and uh, 20, in some countries, 25%, uh, but also, of course, in the cuts in public services, in the services that are provided to the population. And here, we often, we, we have to uh, mention, you know, uh, services provided to victims of domestic violence, of um, of uh, um, uh, social social care, um, child care, etc. Those services that are actually essential to achieve gender equality. Um, in terms of, I will just yeah, uh, the impact of austerity in the long term um, can be quite serious. I mean, the the on the one hand, there's a loss of support for women in uh, public services. So the where women are actually the majority of the, you know, the, the are the majority of the employed in the public service, so that um, uh, women might might uh, um, might lose the, let's say the, their their quality of employment in public services, but at the same time um, the. Uh, loss of women's jobs in public services may increase the overall uh, gender pay gap because jobs in public services are generally better paid than in retail and catering. I think everybody in the room here is quite aware of the gender pay gap and you know the the, the importance uh, the, the the importance uh, of it even today. I mean. Overall, in Europe, it's around 25, between 25 and 30 percent, which is just simply incredible. Um, on the one hand, I think this is an, in, an understanding that has, you know, kind of most in most countries, people have um, integrated this as a as a political or a policy issue, um, but. In, in other um, areas of the world, for example, United States, I mean, this is being presented as a, as a by the by the Obama uh, administration now as a new political, let's say, um, strategic objective that needs to be um, that needs to be handled uh, within uh, within his administration. So I was quite surprised the way that it was being discussed in American press as compared to European. Um, uh, the, the European uh, um, reports on the age on the wage gap, looking at you know the difference in the maturity in terms of dealing with the uh, with the issue. We, the um, factors between the gender um, um, pay gap are, uh, of course, uh, probably also very much known to all of you, um, and.
I think I would like to look at what can be done to uh, yes to uh, uh, you know move out of to move towards solutions and um, I think in the first place uh, you know the, one of the reasons for for um, uh, the pay gap is the fact that women are simply working in sectors that are uh, have lower wages. Um, some of the uh, ways to to address this issue is um, st stimulate w women to move into non-traditional jobs through training, but also through targets uh, for recruitment. Um, getting more women uh, into into management. Um, using negotiations at local level to ensure that all those who have the same skills get the same pay and um, uh, develop new pay systems because um, very often uh, we find that even though the, the, the let's say there is a general rule uh, that stimulates equal equal pay the actual pay systems in themselves are gender biased uh, as well as the social security uh, systems that are in themselves through the way they operate are also uh, gender biased and